So it's early morning on the 24th of November 1844 in the rocks in Sydney when there's three guys, two white, one black, all speaking French, walking up to the Waterman stairs. Now these stairs no longer exist in the rocks but if you kind of know the international terminal, so the Sydney Harbour Bridge side of Circular Quay, not the Opera House side, that's where we are. So these three guys walk up and they're carrying a box. The box is a little over a metre, by a metre, by half a metre, so it's a decently sized box. And two of them have to carry it, while one guy is up the front. He meets up with a ship's captain, this guy's name is John King, and the first French guy says, Oof, I have a box of rotten pork that I need you to dump into Circular Quay. However, this box smells pretty bad and it seems to be leaking a brownish sort of liquid. So as you can probably understand, John King is not overly keen on this situation. He says, mm, this is a bit suspect. I don't think I want to take that. You know, considering at the time in Sydney, it was pretty disgusting in 1844. People just dumped their rubbish on the street or just threw it into Circular Quay. He didn't exactly pay someone to dump it. It's all a bit suspicious. So the two white French guys talk to each other very quickly. Uh, the black French guys just standing there just kind of like mm, whatevs and they quickly decide okay too much trouble. They pick it up and they move on. That's when John King looks at the weird marks that have been left behind from the leakingness from the box and he touches it and he smells it and yet he tastes it. And that's when he knows, yeah, that's blood. <laughs> so, Sheila's blokes and non-binary folks, I'd like to welcome you to the story of the French affair because it involves a lot of French people and oh boy, something kind of messed up happened. Now what's interesting about this story, and a little bit mm, annoying, is the fact that it actually hasn't been written into a book, so I don't have like mm, that sort of resource. So everything that I got, I got from Bug. I got from uh, trove.nla.gov.au. So I was reading old newspapers and that's where a lot of the direct quotes come from. So let's see how we go. Now with the French affair, you're probably understanding, yeah, it does involve quite a few French people. And in 1844, um, they didn't have a huge presence in Sydney as you could probably understand, but there were enough there and there was a community. And it was one of those things where anyone that kind of spoke French kind of vaguely knew each other. Like they were either friends, they worked together, they lived together, they got married. So as what happens with most communities, particularly if there is a language barrier in a foreign country. So considering this whole story is called The French Affair, um, it's going to be a bit funny that I start with an Englishman. Now this man's name was Thomas Warne. He came out to Australia from Devonshire as a free settler. And in 1844, he was working as a rent collector, which was a pretty thankless job. Now the Colonial Observer, the newspaper at the time, described him as thus, so quote, in person, Warren was tall, with a countenance pale and gaunt to be cadaverous, made more striking by masses of dark brown hair falling on his shoulders, and a luxuriant crop of about the same on his chin and upper lip. His walk was slow and professional. He dressed shabby and generally with some peculiarity about it, which was sure to attract notice. His manners to those on whom he waited on their accounts were singularly calm and unruffled. And he received the oft-repeated promise of pay, the angry instruction to call again, or the indignant don't bother me now with the same imper ooh, imperturbable stolidity. Yeah, so Thomas Warne, he sounds kind of gothic. <laughs> to be absolutely honest and he sounds a bit weird everybody kind of said that he was a bit cracked and one other interesting thing about him is that he himself spoke French he spoke enough French to interact with the French community as you can probably understand so his interaction with the French community had actually made court headlines a little bit earlier pre-1844 when he got into a fight with a man called Louis Breton and I know I, the last video was Louis Bertrand but this is Louis Breton and I might say Bertrand by accident, but who knows. But basically, uh, Louis Breton and Thomas Warne fell in love with the same French girl. And from what we can understand, the French girl liked the French boy. She didn't like the English boy, but they did, <laughs> that didn't stop the English boy and the French boy from fighting each other, as you do. And during this fight, Louis somehow managed to grab Thomas's hand 
twist it around and bite part of the pinky off at the knuckle. And then there's reports that he swallowed. However, he probably didn't. It seemed to be a little bit of sensationalized storytelling, made even more so by the fact that when they went to court and over this fight, obviously, and Thomas Warren was like, look what the man did to my finger. Uh, Louis turned around and said, no, Thomas Warren did that to himself. Now, that goes to show exactly how strange Warren must have been that, you know, every, everyone in the court heard that he bit off his own finger to spite this other guy that was in a fight. And they kind of looked at Warren and just went, you know what, he seems to be the kind of guy that would do something like that. He didn't bite off his own finger. That didn't happen. Louis 100% did that to him. And it seems that in the end, neither of them got the girl because um, Warren didn't get her. And Louis left the city and he, he went to Van Diemen's land and was just got out of Dodge. And he did that literally a week before this incident. But it wasn't just the French people that Warren had a problem with. Warren actually had a problem with an Englishman by the name of Edward Turner just a few days before the incident. So he got into a fight with someone, had his finger bit off like a few weeks before the incident, and then he got into a fight with another guy a few days before the incident. And basically, uh, he accused Edward Turner of um, lying in court about some incident. And Turner turned around and accused Warren of lying in court. And then this fight spilled out of court and they got into a physical fight, accused each other of being liars and distrustful and so on and so forth. So basically it just got to the point where each of them were told by the police, shut up, stop yelling at each other, you both suck, I'll see you in court next week. It was just an ongoing thing. Now the two white Frenchmen that I mentioned earlier were two men by the name of Jean Vidal and Jean Duval which is going to suck for the storytelling purposes. But uh, Jean Vidal was a servant who worked for Thomas Warren, but they seem to be, it's more like a, he hired him on a need-to-know basis more than anything else. And Jean Duval uh, was a friend who lived in the same building as Thomas Warren. They all shared like different rooms in the same building. And Duval was also married to another French woman by the name of Marguerite. So it's like these, these two men are the guys that we're focusing on. And back to the Colonial Observer, the newspaper, they described these two men, and I kind of giggle at the way that they described him, because listen to the difference between how they described Videl versus Duval. So, quote, Videl was by far the most striking looking. His tall figure and finely shaped head and neck contrasted sharply with a face naturally harsh and repugnant and rendered doubly so by the deep impress left by smallpox. His hair was black, his eyes small and dark and deeply sunk in his head. His forehead broad and massive. Duval is a small man, insignificant in his appearance except for a low, cunning, and disagreeable expression of countenance." End quote. <laughs> I kind of I like that. Videl, you know, pockmarked, tall, broad, imposing. Duval, that guy. <laughs> so what exactly happened on the night of the 23rd to 24th of November? We only have one witness, so we're going to have to take his word for it. But essentially, Thomas Warren and Jean Videl were meeting together in Thomas Warren's apartment, which was just above Duval's. Now, Jean Duval was out at the time. He was at a pub called The Black Dog, which no longer exists. But basically, Duval is out. His wife is somewhere else. Warren is upstairs with Videl, and they get into an argument. Now, what exactly this argument is about... Don't know. The newspapers cover a, they cover a lot. You'll find out later, but not particularly this. But Videl said that Warren was of an excitable nature. He was getting violent, and he picked up an old sword that he had and threatened to strike Videl through. Now Videl, as you can probably understand, was not so much frightened as just pissed off. It's like, what are you doing, you dumb? This is like the the classic example of the English and the French just just can't get along. But basically, in retaliation, Videl turned around to the fireplace and grabbed a hatchet. And I wish I could say it was a big old axe, but it was a hatchet on uh, the motorbike. <sighs> Side note, I live on the corner of a very busy cross-section and people rev their bikes because they want everybody to know that 
they suck. So anyway, Videl comes back in and threatens Warn with the hatchet and, you know, picks up the hatchet in turn and Warn's got a sword. And apparently Warn just kind of <laughs> doesn't care. He kind of looks at Videl doing that going, yeah, okay, whatever. Turns his back and goes to sit at the desk, kind of shaking his head. And Videl said later that he felt such a rage that he had never known. And without really thinking about it, pulls his hand back and as hard as he can, choo, right under the ear, on the right hand side, just under the ear, as hard as he can with the hatchet. That kind of hurt hitting my head like that. And here is a direct quote once again from the newspaper, quote, Immediately upon receiving the blow, Warren fell to the ground and after a few nervous struggles, expired. End quote. Now these days we're all pretty familiar with the one punch kill, the coward's punch, you know, the stupid thing. You, you can, you can, humanity is amazing. We can fall off a waterfall and be fine or we can trip down the stairs and die, one or the other. But basically one simple, I mean, an axe helps, but one simple chop to the back of the head and Warren was flat on his face and Videl was just left standing there, axe still embedded, staring at the corpse of his friend. And I think he was a bit stunned. <laughs> I think I think he was very surprised that this had happened. And so he did what probably a lot of us would do if you, you just accidentally, well, accidentally on purpose. He wanted to hurt him, but I think just the fact it was so neat and quick <laughs> probably stunned him. Uh, Videl just kind of left the house, locked it up afterwards, and went to the pub. So he goes to the Black Dog, where Jean Duval has been for a very long time. So Jean Duval is women, wine, and songs. He's having a good night. He's gambling away. And Duval and Videl are seen there together um, by a lot of witnesses. They all saw them there for a couple of hours, and they were talking, they were conversing, but what they were talking about, we'll never really know, because they were speaking French, and nobody in the pub at the time either had the inclination to listen or the ability to even know what they were saying. Except for a bloke called Thomas Wilson, but we'll get on to him in a bit. But basically, after talking to Duval, having a bit of a back and forth about this, getting a bit of the bravery gravery into him, uh, Videl leaves the pub, goes back to the house where Warren's body is still face flat on the floor, and he's like, okay, I need to fix this. I would have robbed the house. I would have been on the first boat out of Circular Key that morning. But <laughs> when you murdered someone you didn't mean to murder and you're panicking, you do this. So Videl got an axe, a bigger axe, got a saw, and proceeded to chop the body into pieces, starting with the legs. Apparently it was quite difficult to get through the tendons and stuff around the bones, around the hip. So what I really like about the newspapers of the 1840s is like no censorship. It was written like a novel. So let's let the people of the day take over and they'll tell you exactly what happened. So here we go. And a quote, upon returning to the scene of the murder, he cut off the limbs of the deceased without taking off the clothes and placed the remains upon the fire with the clothes still on them. But from the running of the fat from the body, the chimney soon afterwards took fire. End quote. Yeah, he chopped up the body and then he proceeded to try and put it in the fireplace to cremate it. But here's the thing about cremation. You need a couple of hours of like a thousand degrees Celsius to properly cremate a body. You need a lot of time. If you're just putting uh, bits and pieces into a fireplace, well, in the end, we are but meat and meat cooks. And as the newspaper says, all the fats and fluids were draining off it. He, he wasn't in a pot. The clothing was still on. They mentioned later, you know, the buttons were still done up on the wrist. The feet were still in the shoes. Yeah, so he accidentally caught the chimney on fire. And he was seen by witnesses leaving the second story of the house, clambering onto the roof with a bucket and pouring a few buckets down the chimney. So, to recap, this guy has chopped Thomas Warren in the back of the head, gone for a drink at the pub, come back, chopped up the body into bits and pieces, tried to burn it, that failed. He caught the chimney on fire, he crawls onto the roof, he pours water down the chimney. So this body that he has eviscerated in the, depart in the apartment now has water flowing on it, so now it's all icky and juicy 
and as they say it started leaking because it was up on the second floor started leaking through the floorboards and forming a patch on the ceiling and bits of pieces were coming into the next room underneath oh this guy panicked in the worst possible way so realizing that this isn't working Videl has a new plan he grabs the box that is a little over a meter by a meter by half a meter and he shoves the bits and pieces of worn into this box he then does his best to clean up the house as much as possible and at about five in the morning he goes back to the black dog the pub where Duval is still there <laughs> Duval has been in this pub for like a while and he goes to Duval and then they find another French guy now this guy was uh, called Thomas Wilson and he was described as and I kid you not a man of color which is very politically correct for the 1840s but he was discovered uh, he was described as a man of color uh, from the Isle of France which I'm probably going to mispronounce is uh, Mauritius 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 but he's from the Isle of France and he's described as uh, a Creole French um, and he would later say that he didn't really know what the two white guys were talking about because they were speaking a different a higher level of French um, the, kind of in the same way that I can listen to a Scotsman every now and again and just be like yes we are definitely speaking the same language so that was Thomas Wilson's excuse as to why when these two white guys turned around and said, hi, we have a box that kind of smells and it's leaking and we need someone to help us carry it down to Circular Key. Wilson was like, are you going to pay me? And they're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> okay, I'll do it. So on the morning of Sunday, the 24th of November, 1844, Three French-speaking men, two white, one black, turn up to the waterman's stairs in the rocks in Circular Quay with a box that smells and is leaking. Side note, there are children screaming and playing outside my window. I don't have a... I'm doing this from my bedroom. What can you do? So now we're at the where we started. Uh, and John King, the guy that owns the little boat, is just like, this is the most suspicious thing ever. I'm pretty sure that's blood. If it was just pork, they wouldn't be acting so weird about it. Police! Police! Stop! Yeah, so basically John King basically just starts screaming, uh, as you do, if you think someone's walking around with a body in a box. And here's the thing. Now, the three men had made their way up sort of further into the rocks around where Kendall Lane is, and they had bumped into a police officer called Henry Porter. And Henry Porter had seen them kind of struggling with this box, and being a good constable, he actually was in the process of helping them lift the box onto Wilson and Duval's shoulders. By the way, I don't get why Jean Videl wasn't the one carrying the damn box. But basically, this, this copper was like, ah, oh, this is weird and stinks, but not unusual for Sydney. Here, let me help you. And he was helping them get the box better. When John King comes running in the corner, and he's just like, that's not right. I recommend you opening it. So they kind of drop it to the ground and Henry Porter and another copper turns up and they're just like, um, can we have a look at that box? Cause it smells and it's leaking and you're acting really weird. And what I really love about this is Jean Videl literally ran away. He ran away screaming, key, key, I'm going to get a key. That was his excuse later. Oh, I have to go get the key. And he left Jean Duval and Thomas Wilson behind. And now Jean Duval, I reckon, I reckon 100% Jean Duval knew what was going on and had like advised him to chop up the body. But Thomas Wilson was just standing there just like, I don't know what's going on, man. I mean, I, I think Thomas Wilson had an idea, but ignorance is bliss but basically Videl runs away and the cops are like that is super weird I'm gonna open up this box anyway they open it up they see that there is a blanket on top and they see a foot sticking out and they know and it smells and they're like okay pull it back oh yeah that's a person but the thing is Jean Videl went back to the scene of the crime and to this day we don't know why like what was he trying to achieve with that but they found him at um they found him at Thomas Warren's house and they found a lot of evidence of the murder like it was pretty juicy and so they arrested Jean Videl, Jean Duval and Thomas Wilson and then they went even more extreme they arrested Margaret Duval, Jean Duval's wife then they arrested Edward Turner, the Englishman that was accusing Warren of perjury, which by the way, I love. So Edward Turner was having his own problems with Thomas Warren. Can you imagine his reaction when they come to his house at Monday and they're just like, hi, we have a problem with Thomas Warren. 
And Edward Turner would have been like, yeah, we absolutely do. It's like, yeah, he's been murdered and chopped into pieces and we think he might have done it. <laughs> can, can you imagine? Yeah, so they arrested Edward Turner on suspicion of maybe possibly being accessory or being involved or something. That, that would be horrible for Edward Turner. And then they actually go and get Louis Breton back from Tasmania, back from Van Diemen's Land, because he had been in a fight with Thomas Warne and bit off his finger, and he was also French, and the French always knew each other, and they were like, like just covering all their bases. So they arrest Jean de Val, Jean Videl, Jean de Val's wife, Thomas Wilson, Edward Turner, and Louis Breton all about this because this crime absolutely shocked the colony. This crime terrified everyone because of its brutality and uh, just senselessness, really. I mean, it was just a petty little argument um, that led to a guy getting an axe in the back of the head and then getting chopped into pieces and then getting kind of burnt in the fire and then getting put in a box and then... Ugh. So, silver lining. The early part of the inquest is actually held in a pub, the Sportsman's Arms, which it sounds kind of funny, but that wasn't all that unusual uh, for inquests in Sydney at the time to be held in pubs because those were usually the biggest places. This is before we had a water police court in the rocks and it was just easier to do it there. From the beginning, uh, the guy, the judge, looks at Edward Turner and just goes, well, you have a great alibi, you're free to go. And Edward Turner's like, oh, thank God. Also, I can't get this guy for perjury anymore, but I'm okay with not being accused for murder. The other French guy, Louis Breton, is, has a great alibi. He was in freaking Tasmania. I don't know why they even bothered getting him back, but uh, I, think, I think people were just you know, throwing things out. So the French guy that bit off his finger <laughs> didn't kill him. He just dismembered him early. Also on the plus side, Thomas Wilson. Uh, is found to be completely not guilty as well because Thomas Wilson got up. He apparently spoke quite good English and he turned around and just went, look, I don't know what these crazy white fellas were talking about. They were, it, it's like, it's like me listening to Scottish people talk. I don't know what they're saying. It might be the original English, but who cares? Or the original French. But um, yeah, so he was found not guilty as well. So he was released and um, Duval's wife, Margaret Duval, was also released. Uh, so immediately four people were out and then it was just the two, Jean Videl and Jean Duval. Now, when they went to court in Darlinghurst, Jean Videl was apparently quite um, sorry. He was apparently very penitent and very open about everything that happened. He confessed straight away. He was just like, yeah, I did this. Yeah, I chopped him up. Yeah, I put him in a box. My bad. Uh, why did I murder him? It was a moment of rage. I just didn't think things through. And then I drunk a lot, which is when I cut him up. And like I said, and like the jury and the judge, they were so bloody sure that Jean Duval was an accessory after the fact. They're pretty certain that Jean Duval probably advised Videl to chop him up and get rid of the body. Um, but Videl swore up and down, left and right, that he did not tell Duval a single thing. He said, I never told Duval what I did. I, I never asked him for advice. I didn't tell him what was in the box. He's completely innocent. And because people saw him talking, but nobody, nobody knew what they were talking about, it couldn't be proved. So Jean Duval was found, initially he was found guilty and then he was acquitted because uh, they just didn't have any evidence against him. And with the fact that Videl confessed and then swore that nobody else knew, which I suppose is a bit of honor in the end, and then only three months after the trial, on the 7th of February, 1845, Vidal was hanged in Darlinghurst jail. And now there's more noise. So I'm just gonna wrap this up because it's just noisy. I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you enjoyed another true crime story. Let me know. I'll probably do something that isn't true crime later on, but until then, um, look after yourselves and have a lovely week. Bye.